So I really messed up today. Apparently I'm a week ahead. Alex pointed out this mistake. I'm wearing the wrong color on the wrong week. <laughs> so I'm going to do a little prophecy right now. <laughs> At 11.05, someone is going to come in the church and say, where are you guys going? <laughs> Was it funny? <laughs> Not as funny as I thought. Anyway, yeah, I'm a mess, especially after that worship. Wow. When the Holy Spirit moves, you're going to have to give me a minute to compose myself this morning. If you are new here among us, my name is Gene, and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. I'm also continually excited to be in our Corinthian series. This is where we're looking at the books of 1st and 2nd Corinthians, their letters, actually, from Paul the Apostle to the church in Corinth, where they're experiencing... Issues. That is why we are asking the underlying question throughout this entire series. Are we any different? Are we any different as a people, as a church today? Today, we are arriving in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul continues making appeals, but this time it's a little bit different. He's been appealing to the church in Corinth to be generous. This is in that offering for the mother church in Jerusalem. Titus is going to come collect. Don't embarrass me. <laughs> He's about to say that. This is a different kind of appeal that Paul is making now in the 10th chapter. He's going to start talking about the super apostles, as he sarcastically calls them. They're, they're the false teachers. They're puffing themselves up, talking about their credentials, putting Paul down. So Paul's in a position where he's forced to talk about his credentials, and he's not happy about it. We're entering into the fool's boast. That's going to be in chapter 11. Paul, not happy at all. The subject of boasting is going to come up here in this letter. So this morning, we're going to talk about some ways in which we boast, ways in which we make ourselves seem more important than we really are. There are a lot of ways we do this, but most of the time when we do this, we make ourselves look like fools, as Paul will say. And it makes me think of a story about a general. See, once, picture World War II era, when they had the nicest uniforms, I think. World War II, general, one-star general. He's kind of upset. He's not getting the respect he feels he deserves. He's not a four-star general. So he's not hanging out with the president. He's not making really big decisions. So he's always looking for opportunities as to how he can make himself seem more important. One day, an opportunity knocks at his door. A private comes to his office. Knox, the general, seizes the opportunity, says, hold on a minute, I'm on the phone. And he pretends to be on the phone with the president. Yes, Mr. President, yes, yes, I, I know you really need my advice, but I'm, I'm very busy. Well, I know, you're welcome, Mr. President. I know, yep, I'm going to give you some advice on what we should do overseas. Yes, I know. Well, again, you're welcome. I'm happy to be there for you, sir. Yes. <clears throat> Hangs up the phone. Calls the private in. Come in. Private does the obligatory salute. General says, what is it? Well, sir, I'm here to hook up the phone. <laughs> Basically the premise for every sitcom ever, right? <laughs> Many variations of that joke. But what, what happens? Most sitcoms, it's about someone making themselves seem important, getting caught in a lie. It all blows up in their face. That's the premise. We make ourselves look silly. Today, we're going to look at some ways in which we boast, and it's not always with words. We do this with all kinds of things. When I thought I made it in the business world, I did this with cars. I thought I was all that with my cars. But then you move here to Naples and realize that's, <laughs> that's impossible. I don't know why they have a Naples car show on Fifth Avenue. What's the point of that? 
There's a Naples car show every half hour. All you need to do is sit at any restaurant at Fifth Avenue, and I guarantee you it won't take more than 15 minutes to see these cars in this exact order. Bentley, Ferrari, <laughs> Lamborghini, no big deal, Maserati, whatever, <clears throat> Mercedes. <pfft. laughs> it was futile. I realized that when I moved here, <laughs> driving around in my fancy car. You want to know how when someone's really, really rich, they get a really horrible color Lamborghini. But you got a lot of money when you would get a car in that color. Someone who has a lot of money and another one in the garage. It's a futile thing to do. People do this with their homes. Maybe we think we've made it. We buy a 3,000 square foot home. Someone comes along with a 6,000 square foot home and says, the house is twice as big. Then there's someone with a 15,000 square foot home. Laughs at the 6,000 square foot home guy. Be quiet. I have a pool house bigger than that. 3,000 square foot home guy laughs. 15,000 square foot home guy goes, my dog house is bigger than your house. My kids have a tree fort bigger than that. It's futile. We end up looking like fools at any level when we try to do that. There's always a four-star general above us. Now, really quickly, it's okay to have nice things. Hear me on that. It's okay. That's not my point. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. It's just not okay when we use them to boast, when we use things or words to make ourselves seem more important than someone else, especially as Christians. So Paul, he's going to prep for this fool's boast. He's going to talk about his missions, the things he's doing in the mission field. It's quite an impressive resume, actually, but he doesn't want to do it. He's forced to. So here's how he preps for it in chapter 10. Chapter 10 is like a prep for this. 2 Corinthians 10, 1. Now I, Paul, make a personal appeal to you by the gentleness and graciousness of Christ. I, who am humble among you in person, but bold toward you when absent. So here we're going to see that Paul addresses another issue of his possible stature and behavior when he's present with them versus when he's writing to them. He continues, For it is said, his letters are weighty and powerful, but his physical presence is weak, and his public speaking is despicable. Imagine saying that about your pastor. <laughs> there was that issue of disunity in 1 Corinthians, the first topic that we were talking about, caused by following after the church leaders instead of Jesus. You have the eloquent Apollos. He's great at rhetoric and public speaking. And Paul, not so much. He says this. Such a person should consider this. What we are in the words of our letters when absent, we will be in actions when present. Sounds like a threat. Kind of is. Now, in today's world, someone might accuse Paul of being a keyboard warrior. That's what's kind of going on here. When he's there, it's kind of like this wimpy, squeaky guy. He's not coming with a rod all the time. And when he writes to them, he sounds more aggressive. At least that's the accusation. You know, that's probably not true. Do we do this? Do we send emails to people with all kinds of things that we wouldn't say to them if we were face to face? Do we send the texts with all the capital letters yelling at them? Do we do this today? And then all of a sudden, when they call in to respond, we swipe them to voicemail? Have we done that? This is where we really need accountability, companions. My wife had the idea of being a designated texter. <laughs> Give me the phone. <laughs> she does this for people, I think, that she works with. They check with her before they text certain things. It's a good idea. And I know how she came up with the idea. And she allowed me to share this story. I had to get permission because it represents one of the greatest text fails in our family history. Not that I've never failed, but this one's good. <laughs> Some of you know, if you know me, I used to work in the martial arts industry. That's the business I was in, trying to get all those fancy cars. Now, you can't think of it as karate or taekwondo. 
where everybody has all this respect and stuff, and they're bowing, yes, and say, nope. It wasn't anything like that at all. It was more like a fight gym. <laughs> Think of something in between boxing and fight club, like that. <laughs> really crazy environment. It was a mixed martial arts school, UFC, if you've ever heard about it. So they had to teach these fighters, these animals. I liken the profession more to a zookeeper than a martial arts instructor. I was always putting them back in their cages and out of their cages and stuff, and they'd have these personalities, they'd be arguing all this stuff would be going on. New Year's Eve comes. <clears throat> now, you don't want them all drinking and fighting, right? <laughs> so we knew there was one that the other instructors weren't getting along with. So we weren't going to invite him to New Year's Eve. So Heather sends out the invites, starts texting everybody, texts one instructor, hey, Come on over New Year's Eve, BYOB. <laughs> but don't tell so-and-so, because we're not inviting him. Send to so-and-so. <laughs> oh, yeah, everybody's like, oh. <laughs> we got to check before we send the texts. Do we do that? Do we text things to people that we're not going to say directly to them? What's a better way to handle it? What about the comments section of posts on social media? <laughs> I feel like I'm sinning when I read those. <laughs> like, I know I shouldn't be doing it. Am I provoking myself to aggravation? Definitely don't comment in the comments section. That's not what it's for. <laughs> you know why? You're going to ruin three days of your life because you're going to be checking the reply to your comment every three to five seconds. <laughs> don't do it. But is this where people vent? They say things and they take on a persona. Are we keyboard warriors sometimes? The super apostles, they are boasting big time about their credentials. Paul, again, he's got to deal with it. He doesn't want to deal with it, so he's going to boast. And here's how he kind of sets it up. He's going to frame it. 2 Corinthians 10, 15. We are not bragging beyond measure about other people's labors. But we have the hope that as your faith increases, our area of ministry will be greatly enlarged so that we may proclaim the good news to the regions beyond you, not boasting about what has already been done in someone else's area of ministry. So the one who boasts must boast in the Lord, for it is not the one commending himself who is approved, but the one the Lord commends. Now, there's a couple of things at play here. One kind of attaches to what I said about Romans 15 about not building on another person's work. In that context, it's not going to the places the gospel's already been preached, going to different places, and then he gets around to saying, okay, I'm going to come to Rome now. Context here is boasting. So he doesn't want to even make the mistake about boasting about somebody else's work, taking credit for someone else's work. Paul says the one who boasts should boast in the Lord. That's it. But even in light of what we are commanded, there are a lot of people doing this in ministry. Is that another thing that we do with our phones? Do we do that? I don't think we can deny that social media has nurtured an extremely narcissistic culture. Do we agree on that? Very narcissistic. Unfortunately, a lot of Christians are happy to just jump right in and then use a bunch of scriptures to make it okay. Yet where does the Bible say that narcissism's okay? I haven't found it yet. <laughs> Do we boast with our selfies? I'm not good looking enough to do that. Do we do that? We don't need to use words. As I said, we can do it with our cars, our houses. We can do it with our selfies. So here's the thing. <clears throat> I'm going to throw myself under the bus. If you know me and you follow me on social media, you'll see I don't really take selfies a lot. <laughs> this is what you all look like when you do selfies. I'm going to try. My daughter laughs at me. I've failed at this before. I tried to do it. And she's like, what are you doing? So here it is. It's got to be like here somewhere, right? I think like the phone needs to be always at like an angle, right about here. 
why not here? I don't know. Why not here? I get it. I get it. No one wants to look up your nose. But, you know, something, and I don't know where the angle is. I just pretend to know, it's, but it's right about here. And then, you know, you got to find your, your, you know what I mean? Like the hair, I don't want to mess it up. But you got to, the hair goes in your face. It's got to cut with your face. And, you know, you do that. And then, you know, if you're a girl, <laughs> blue steel, right? You get your best. And trust me. It ain't off the cuff. Nobody takes a selfie like this, and that's it. It's never that fast. You spend too much time setting it up. Way too much time. Way too much. And the older we get, like, the closer it is. And it's like just a picture of our eye, you know what I mean? Like, with the blur filter. <laughs> get all the wrinkles out. <laughs> is this silly? Yes! <laughs> it's really silly. Uh, but we do this. Okay, now I'm going to get serious. We do this even in missions, in ministry. <laughs> and so I want to think it through for a minute. Paul doesn't say brag about this stuff. He doesn't say that, right? Like you get, like, you know, the worship leaders and the, the, here's my pedal board and here I am ready to lead worship, look at me. What's it about? I've done that as a worship leader. Caught myself in it. What am I worshiping? The worship or Jesus? I don't know. Now, here's the retort. I'm going to give you the retort because I've heard it way too many times. But no, 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 no. In Matthew 5, it says, let your light shine. Let everybody see you do all your good works and your worship. That's what it says in Matthew 5. Oh, yeah, I forgot because the gospel would never spread without my selfies or my social media account, would it? That's what it says in Matthew 5. But keep reading. Matthew 6, same sermon, one continuous flow. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of people, to be seen by them. <laughs> Otherwise, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So <clears throat> whenever you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be applauded by people. I assure you, they've got their reward. But when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret and your father who sees you in secret, secret will reward you. Look what that actually says in Matthew 5 just before that. It says, yes. You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand. And it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Look at it again. It says, let, let your light shine. Just do it, and then shut up about it. <laughs> That's it. That's what he says in Matthew 6, short form. Don't even let yourself know you're doing it. Proverbs 27.2, let another praise you, and not your own mouth, a stranger, and not your own lips. Let another take the pictures. These are passive acts of boasting. Everyone here, I bet, unless you're young, you've probably heard of Mother Teresa. We know who Mother Teresa is? I think everybody in the world knows who Mother Teresa is. She's really famous, like as famous as Gandhi. Really, really famous. We know why she's famous. A lot of good works. Big on good works. Where's her social media account? Where's the selfies? She didn't need it. It's a pretty modern invention. Gospel got by pretty good for about the first 2,000 years of Christianity without social media, I'd have to say. When we boast about our good works, our lack of humility spoils the genuineness of the deed. Have you ever done something for someone but lacked the patience <laughs> to let them notice it? Husbands, under the bus again. Do we do this? We do the dishes or the laundry, right? We got to remind our wives that we did it. Look what I did. We find passive ways, you know what I mean? Like, is the laundry done? 
I don't know. I know, because I did it. <laughs> this new shirt, it's clean. It can be kind of annoying, though, right? We're bragging about it, reminding, oh, that time I did the dishes. <laughs> that time I did this. Because the whole time, they're not saying anything about basically being superwoman. <laughs> it's patronizing. Patronizing. We, we don't just do that with words. We do that with actions as well. It's when we step in for a minute to do a little bit of the heavy lifting and then come out and say, that was easy, or boast about it. We do that. Now, do we do this in ministry or missions? Think about it. Do we do this on mission? Do we do any patronizing in missions? I posted this said Jesus never meme. I'll give you a second to read it. <laughs> it's funny because it's kind of true. We do that. Now, I want to make a disclaimer here because I've been making fun of selfies a lot and that's <clears throat> anti-cultural. Just as it's okay to have nice things, it's okay to take selfies. You're all right. Maybe a little narcissistic, but that's okay. We all are. <laughs> Especially if it's an ussy, right, with your families. There's more than one person in it. Howie Mandel, I give him credit for that one. It was a good one. Sophie, she's our selfie stick. We go on vacations. I don't want to ask anybody to touch the phone. She does it. She's got the selfie stick arm, and she knows the right angle. I just stand there. I'm like, where do I look? Where do I look? Heather's like, you smile really weird. Just smile normal. I'm like, I am smiling normal. It's all right. What I'm talking about <laughs> is what we do in ministry, not with our families or having fun. Have a good time. I don't want to spoil that. We often patronize those we are trying to help in the mission field. Think about it. Now, instead of talking about what we actually do, I want you to imagine for a minute if this was done to us. And it's really hard to imagine here in Naples, right? I told you about the Daily Car Show. But I'm going to tell you about a place that's really, really nice. And I want to imagine a scenario here. I'm going to paint an imaginary scenario just to kind of show you what it might be like to be on the other side. Now, I told you I was in the martial arts industry, right? <clears throat> Fighters, all that stuff. The founding art of UFC or mixed martial arts is Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Sounds like a weird thing. I'm not going to explain it. Just Brazilian jiu-jitsu. That's the martial art that founded the ultimate fighting championship, just so you know. It's where the cage fighting stuff comes from. The Sheik of Abu Dhabi, as weird as this sounds, is a huge fan. Was a huge fan years ago. I don't follow it anymore. He's really, really rich. You would think that house is the biggest ones here in Naples are like cute. <laughs> yeah, that's cute. He does have a pool house <laughs> that size. It's crazy. I've never been to Abu Dhabi. I never got to go. I was never good enough. And he sponsors a competition called Abu Dhabi. It's in the United Arab Emirates. And he is loaded. He's got all kinds of money. So all the fighters would clamor to get into this competition to fight in Abu Dhabi because it paid really well. I know one fighter who got a brand new BMW, like no big deal. You know, that's what he gives his kids for their 16th birthday or something. I don't know, better than that. But new car, all kinds of money. And, and if you're the best, you get to tutor the sheik and stay in his palace. It's ridiculously nice. So I want you to imagine something. Like somebody like ridiculously, private jets rich. Like really, 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 really rich. Has everything. But it's not just the money. It's the lifestyle. He has like a harem, you know, <laughs> trying to be nice with their kids here. You know what I mean? It's just it's a totally wild lifestyle. So I want you to imagine for a minute, I go to Abu Dhabi. Not because I'm good enough to go to Abu Dhabi, not because I want to fight, but because I want to convert the sheik. I know he has influence, and I want to get him to go from jujitsu to Jesus, like I did. And so I go there on my mission trip to the Middle East <laughs> in Abu Dhabi. And let's say I talk to the sheik. He's not believing me right away. I say, okay, sheik, if I can tap you out, you got to convert. Deal. By the power of the Holy Spirit, I tap him out. <laughs> right? So he converts. 
Simple as that. <clears throat> he learns all about the gospel. I teach him everything I know. I go back home. No point for me there anymore, even though I like the palace. My wife wants me back. <laughs> so I go back to Naples. Now the sheik starts converting people. Let's say he's converting people. He's telling people all about Jesus. He's got a lot of influence. And finally, a natural question comes up to all these people that he converts. He said, well, you know, tell me about this Pastor Gene guy that converted you. He won't mention that I tapped him out. <clears throat> so, yeah, Gene, well, he lives in Naples in America. And well, we want to go. We want to go to America. We want to go to Naples. We want to go on a mission trip. So she starts thinking about it, thinking it through. All right. It's a little different there, guys. <laughs> Can't bring all your women. <laughs> Women are different there. They don't wear the veils and everything like that. So you've got to get used to that. You've got to be sensitive to their culture. They're different. Okay. Oh, and Pastor Gene doesn't live in a palace. Nobody does. There's no palaces there. He lives in a little 2,000 square foot home, so we're going to have to bunk up. They're like, okay, it's going to be tight. All right, we can deal with that. Thinks about it a little more. He's like, another thing, the kitchen. The kitchen is like in the middle of the house, and then they build the rest of their house around the kitchen. Everything revolves around the kitchen. They have nice counters and the cabinets and all that stuff, and they're like, that's weird. Isn't that where the servants work? Yeah, I know, but don't say that, because actually, I'll take it a step further. They take great pride in their servant work. Great pride in their servant work, so don't call it that. You may have to help with the servant work, and they're like, oh. Okay, so we'll train for the mission trip. About a week before, we're going to stay in the pool house and cook each other meals. Is that all right? Yes, that's what we're going to do. So they train. They get ready to come here. They fly in in their private jet. They buy Lambos. They buy Lamborghinis to drive around in. They stay with me. They make it about a night before they have to go to the Ritz-Carlton. They're done with my house. They don't want to cook anymore. But maybe while they were here, we shared social media accounts. We made friends. Right? We're going to keep in touch with these people. And so as they leave, maybe I'm scrolling through, and I'm like, oh, there's a picture of Sophie. Their selfie stick arm, and one of the people here that visited, they're cooking together. Isn't that nice? Great. But it's in Arabic, so I have to click C translation. All right? C translation. Oh, look at me doing the servant work with this peasant girl. Hmm. Patronizing, isn't it? Doesn't feel good. There's a dude... <laughs> He's uber rich, drives Lamborghinis. He steps in to the servant work for just a minute, comes on out, and boasts about it. Do we do this? One more thing. Maybe I'm sending an email to the sheik because maybe he gave $50,000, a lot of money to me. 50 grand to him, nothing. He writes the check. So I'm going to thank him for it and be gracious, but I'm going to take a second and be bold. I don't like the selfie thing. It bothers me. I'm going to ask him a question. I'm going to say, Sheik, you know, I noticed something. When you were here, you bought like a bunch of Lamborghinis. You didn't stay at my house. You stayed at the Ritz. Like, how much money did you spend coming here? He answers me, $500,000. It costs us $500,000 to come here or there to America. Now I'm feeling bold. I love you, Sheik. But next time, just send the money. That would be a bold thing to say. It kind of is. And that's why a lot of people in these third world countries that we help don't say it. But they're starting to. I've heard it myself. Don't come here anymore. We know the gospel. It's ridiculous when we spend 10 times the amount of money to deliver a tenth of the money. <laughs> Makes no sense. We told this to a business person. They'd be like, you're crazy. What are you doing? What's the point? Missions isn't and was never meant to be about us. We need to stop using these poor people to feel convicted about our gluttony and better appreciate our excessive living. It's a little ridiculous. Think about it. Essentially, what I'm doing is spending a ton of money to go see people who really needed that money in the first place so I could feel convicted about my sin. Does that sound crazy? Because it is. I spoke about tithing a couple of weeks ago, another hard message, and I told you the primary function of giving was worship. That is the primary function of everything. 
everything that we do as Christians. We are here to give glory to God. Simple as that. That's it. Romans 12.1, Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Did you hear that? I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Man, you don't see anyone posting that one as the meme of the day. Here's my scripture of the day. I'm going to go out and be a living sacrifice. I have plans for you <laughs> to be a living sacrifice. Amazing. Holy. Holy, set apart to the Lord and pleasing to God. Read it. This is your spiritual worship. Remember I told you that. Anyone can come in. You don't have to be a Christian to come here and sing a song. You don't. Showed you that Tozer meme. Gut punch. Right? Christians don't tell lies. We just go to church and sing them. I was uncontrollably bawling through that song. Jesus, you are enough. Here's the question in my mind. Is he? Really? <laughs> oh. It was an apology through the whole song. I'm so sorry. What am I doing? This isn't to make you feel bad. <laughs> it's to bring us all into right thinking, into holiness. When we make missions or anything else about us, it negates that sacrificial act of worship. We make it about us, anything, we turn it into idolatry. Worse yet, we disguise idolatry as worship. We should be doing all ministry without any boasting of any kind at all. Can we do missions without the selfies? Leave the camera home. Yeah, we can. Can we donate without getting a plaque with our name on it? Yes, we can. Can we give as an act of worship knowing that maybe nobody will see it but God? And that's okay. Totally fine. The scriptures we twist in order to make ourselves known must be reconciled and tempered with the ones that speak of humility and the sin of pride and boasting. There's more of those in there. As I showed you in Matthew 5 and 6, Jesus makes himself very clear about it. We should give like that. Jesus blesses us so that we can be a blessing. And we must trust in him for the reward, not seeking the approval of men. Don't worry about that. We have to trust that the good deed we do will be amplified according to the will of the Lord, not our will. But those who need to see it, let another take the photo. And don't set it up. Yes, we want to meet people where they are, but we need to remove the cloud of our culture from the gospel and see everything that we do through a biblical lens so that we get out of the way and get it right. That's what's important. So my encouragement to you this week, yes, let's go out and let our light shine, amen? So that all the glory goes to God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you.